more fruit driven without a whole lot of tannin. Sangiovese, uh, at least to my mind, um, it's like a more robust Pinot and it's very much a, for me, it's sort of like the three-legged bar stool of uh, ripeness, acid and tannin all sort of in perfect balance. Uh, and these 100 degree plus days we have coming up tend to screw that up a little bit at the last moment. Um, so I'm watching the Sangiovese like a hawk um, because uh, it's just, it's, it's such a specific sort of, for me, for Sangiovese to be right, or not to be right, I should, because Sangiovese, it can be casual, it can be very fruit driven, it doesn't necessarily have to be tannic, but it's not a grape with a whole lot of body to it and having that sort of wiry, medium weight, even light to medium weight frame, and some minerality on the finish, uh, and that, that really uh, sort of fine-grained angular tannin that I like so much in Chianti Classicos and more robust Brunellos, sort of getting all those pieces to line up in time and space is a little bit nerve-wracking. Yeah. And I, I think it's one of the reasons why Sangiovese in California has probably been maybe along with Nebbiolo like the greatest heartbreak so far of Italian grapes planted here <laughs> it's very finicky so it's much very promise. specific so much promise so, so yeah, much. yeah 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 you know here in the endless sunlight and you know you would think it would but it, it's it's a grape it needs some constraints it tends to be very productive so it takes a lot of work in the field to really keep the vines balanced um, I know for us, in order to keep the acidity up, you have to leave on a certain amount of fruit, but Sangiovese wants to produce too much. So when I go through it, I look at every single vine as a unique individual and the crop load and how thick the canes are and how long the canes are. And it's very much just an iterative process trying to figure out you know, what each vine individually wants to hopefully get to that finish point where those three factors are all in line. Right. So that might be a little more technical and metaphysical than I meant it to be. But um, yeah, it's part of what makes Sangiovese for me is just so damn addictive because it's, it's such a narrow band of hitting it right that it's, it's, it's like one of those super simple chef dishes where you just have to, the caramelization, it's got to be right to the millisecond for it to come out right. 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 Unlike Barbera, which, you know, you can let it hang for another week and you got to jam your Barbera and everybody's happy. Yeah. Sangiovese does not behave like that. Oh, you know, looking at your, uh, at your, your, your kind of your vineyard and those of you who have, uh, who have me on small, maybe uh, put, put, put my screen up on full so you can see uh, Pietro's uh, uh, vineyard layout here. Um, you want to talk just a little bit about kind of where your Sangiovese is? I know you have a lot of Brunello clones. Um, kind of yeah. and if I if I knew then what I knew now the vineyard map would look a little bit different okay. um, but that's part of the process uh, looking at the letters I believe I over to the side is one of the classic Brunello types uh, the Sun goes from left to right mm -hmm. uh, and I planted that one in that orientation so there'd be a little bit of shading on the back side of the vine so that there would hopefully be a balance between the more ripe sun drenched side and a little bit of that less developed on the back side. Right. Uh, M is a type from Emilia Romagna, which they actually grow a lot of Sangiovese there as well. We don't necessarily see quite as much of it. Um, and it's often very casual, uh, but I actually think some of the, an Italian nurseryman actually told me that Emilia Romagna has some of the best clones and they really do sort of add some mid palate spice. Uh, maybe not quite as much acidity, maybe not quite mm -hmm. as much tannin as the Tuscan ones, mm -hmm. but sort of that middleweight body. Oh, that C, mm -hmm. those are all olive trees. The, oh. And then Q, Excuse I think, yeah. Uh, let's see, Q is of Prugnolo Gentile, which makes Vino Nobile de Montepulciano, which is another type of Sangiovese, which Paul can talk about in depth. Um, 
a little bit different, very thin skinned, not very vigorous, super finicky, gets a lot of sunburn. It almost acts completely different from the other four types of Sangiovese we have. You need to be producing. Very peculiar. Uh, then next to it is another type of Emilia Romagna clone, but planted in different orientation. Mm -hmm. And then right next to that, and I had to drive to Idaho practically to get these, but the little O strip there is Biondi Santi, which was the first Brunello producer. This is known as the Biondi Santi clone. Um, and it's a very robust Sangiovese clone, very late ripening, a lot of tannin, noticeably more than Ooh. all the other types. Uh, deeper, more leathery flavors, and uh, very slow growing and not super vigorous. What's so, interesting, I, I think, uh, is as you look you at- slide the map up a little bit? What's that? Um, can you slide the map up just a touch? I'm oh. not sure I can, actually. Okay. Um, I'm so sorry, it's in PowerPoint. <laughs> not, a pro not a problem, thank it's, you. It's, it's left, it's, uh, I'll try and figure out once we break off of this. Um, I can um, send it to, if somebody's really curious, it's on our website also. Oh, okay. okay. Um, um, one thing I think that's interesting is, you know, when we've got, uh, as you see, Biondi Santi next to that name, that Sangiovese clone name, and uh, all the others are named after areas or just numbers. Um, so the Biondi Santi family is really important um, when it comes to Tuscan history of winemaking in general, but most uh, specifically uh, when it comes to Sangiovese Grosso, which is the local, which is the, the, the technical name for the local clone. Um, of Sangiovese in Montalcino, which they call Brunello. Um, and it's, uh, they, this family start, has, you know, started way back in the 1700s. Um, Ferruccio Biondi Santi was among the first to start to uh, figure out massal selection, um, which is essentially growing grapes in your vineyard for such a long time at such various altitudes and so on and so forth, and pulling cuttings from each of those vines and roads and essentially propagating your own great your own your own clone your own your own species not species but uh, the kind of face of a grape um, and the Biondi Santi family took this very seriously and they did it over a, a long period of time and they really crafted hardy Brunello clones um, what, what what how that, that that's a pretty small plot that you have there yeah it's only 150 vines gotcha gotcha wow you think it gives this wine the, the umph that's kind of in the background. <laughs> uh, it's only really coming online now because it's been such a slow grower. Uh, so in the 2016, I don't, I don't think we even had any crop to put in the current bottle. Gotcha. Everybody has. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, the uh, Moncali, uh, what we have in the first uh, cut, and, and if you've got, if you're interested in, uh, you know, pulling a first glass in front of you and, and, and kind of getting into it, and I'd love to get everyone's thoughts in a little bit, but uh, mm -hmm. the estate Moncali uh, comes from just south of Montalcino, uh, which is where the Biondi Santi family are, along with uh, a number of other producers. And, and this area uh, south of Montalcino is very uh, important, Montalcino Sud, they call it, um, for uh, probably some of the best vines in the area, if not some of the best vines in all of Tuscany. Um, and uh, Moncali is just down the street. Um, and uh, so you're getting a little taste, <laughs> a little taste of Southern Montalcino, although mo this, this particular bottling is their kind of fun IGT Toscano bottling, which is, is, is more about gathering grapes from many areas around Montalcino, as well as along the Tuscan coast and uh, blending it together to create something fun and every day and it's got a little bit of age to it which is nice um so anyway a little bit of a little bit of parallels there can I, pietro can i ask um we, we were going through all of your different uh sangio vese uh, <laughs> all, all of those go into this wine that we're drinking yes you know, although, although over the years as the blocks have matured the ratio has changed a little bit but they're picked at different times and fermented separately and then combined. Gotcha. Yeah. They, they kind of, at least philosophically, they all have their place. Since we're kind of in a good place that can do Sangiovese, but it's a little warmer than Sangiovese would like to be. So it gives me a little bit of elbow room to sort of pull back on jammy fruit and keep tannin and acid in balance. What happens to the extra? Like you must, as you're blending, you must have like, you know, you think the right ratio is whatever and you have a little too much of something. No, no, I actually intend to use all, I mean, there, sometimes there'll be a barrel that, or 
occasionally something doesn't quite make it in, but it's not a whole lot. It's, you know, 60 gallons, a barrel. Um, and that always sort of disappears into other things. There's always a barrel that's not quite full enough and one that's too full during, <laughs> during harvest. So, you know, Sangiovese doesn't blend particularly well um, in my, or it loses a sense of purity, I think. So if I have 11 and a half barrels, that other half will go somewhere else rather than putting something into it to make 12 yeah. for me. Can I ask a question? What does the, what are the clones? Like I'm new to wine, so I'm just wondering. Oh what, yeah. What does a Sangiovese clone mean? Like rather than yeah. original wine? And clone is a really clunky word. I wish we had a biotype or uh, something like that. Um, but grapes, they, over time, they sort of, uh, they're wind pollinators and they sort of inbreed a little bit. And just like animals or anything else, uh, certain genetic things occur over time. So there'll be these different, uh, different types of Sangiovese. Right now, I think there are maybe 130 registered in Italy. Um, and some will have darker grapes, some will have bigger grapes, some will have more leaves, some less, some will be more floral, just in the compounds they produce naturally. Um, and kind of you isolate these things from vineyards and they're all the same DNA, but they have different characteristics that have just developed over decades and centuries even. So clone refers to like one of those 30 types of Sangiovese? Like they're each yeah, a clone? Yeah, exactly. Okay. It, can, it, it can get a little complicated. I, I had a, long, a conversation at, in depth with a, a guy named Ian D'Agata. I don't know if anyone ever has that book called The Native Grapes of Italy. But the highly recommend it. I, I, was, I pulled him off to the side and the first question I had for him was like, you know, when I'm talking to my students about Sangiovese and, and the three different prevailing varietals in Tuscany, um, and then all the other clones and all the other ones, how do I talk about it? And he kind of said, you know, it's, it's a little hard and it gets a little confusing, but he said, you know, you, in, in Italy, you can focus on three biotypes, um, which is uh, San Giovetto in Chianti, uh, Prugnolo Gentile in Montepulciano, and San Giovese Grosso in Montalcino. And they're all the same grape, but they just have very different characteristics to them. Um, the San Giovetto in Chianti comes from hills, which is a little bit cooler area, and the soils are a little bit less fertile, and, uh, and, and, and it's very aromatic. It can be very clean and sometimes be ranging onto medium and sometimes full-bodied, <laughs> but mostly in reserve. But uh, those are typically, you know, aromatically very, very beautiful wines. And as you travel down to Montalcino, where it's Sangiovese Grosso, and in the town of Montalcino, they just call it Brunello. Um, and that's a, a more robust, hearty clone that's got a nice backbone, a structure of acidity and tannin, and is able to take a, a little bit of weight of fruit, certainly as you get further south of the town. And then if you go southeast to the town of Montepulciano, they make a richer style that's a little bit more fruit driven and a little more capturing kind of baking spice qualities, and that's called Vino Nobile. Di Monte Pulciano. And that's my little Tuscany class in 60 seconds. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That's so if you think of those three, and then we can get into like the Biondi Santi clones and Montalcino and the <coughs> Ricapsoli and the, the, the clones that uh, this gentleman here in Castellari, um, um, uh, Paolo, came up with um, as well. He came up with his own uh, clones in, uh, of San Giovetto and Chianti. Um, then it gets, then it, you know, we can talk a little bit more about nuance in the glass. Um, but those big three are kind of the big three to keep your mind on. Paul, does the Macaulay use a Brunello clone? Uh, they do. They, they, they make Brunello primarily. Um, they're, they're a Brunello producer and, and they're, they're historic. Um, they've, been, they've been doing it for quite some time. So would this be like a Rosso de a Montalcino? You know, that, that, that's an excellent question because it's very much like a Rosso de Montalcino, but they had to declassify it um, to IGT, which is Indicazione Geografica Tipica. And uh, because they use grapes not only in Montalcino, they, they use a little bit of Rosso de Montalcino, they'll use a little bit of their Brunello grapes, very small portion. But then they'll often get grapes from Monte Cuco in the south and perhaps closer to the Tuscany. Yeah. 
Um, and so this is a bit more of a field blending of Sangiovese Grosso. And maybe there's some Prugnolo Gentile in here. I, I don't know. <laughs> they don't give that much information. Um, you know, on, that, on the same vein, I'm curious, um, Pietro, how did you decide which clones you wanted? I was going to ask the same question. <laughs> yeah, part of it was uh, back in the old days, the, uh, the company that we were buying the grapevines from, uh, Nova Vine, they have a, uh, well, I guess, a contract exclusively with Vivi Cooperativi Rachedo, who are the biggest exporters of Italian vines. So they would get the cuttings from Italy and then propagate them and then sell them here in California. Uh, early on in my winemaking career, we were able to buy grapes from the growing grounds out there, which were actually out in Yolo County towards Sacramento. And they're growing, they're basically growing budwood out there. They're not growing grapes for top quality wine necessarily. But I, over the years, I ended up spending a lot of time out there. And there were, you know, 15 rows of Sangiovese, one type next to another, next to another, next to another. And I was able to buy the grapes and make some wine and talk to a couple of the Italian importers, get a little bit of insight, do a little bit of research, um, and see which ones had characteristics that I liked and seeing you know, with research, this one tends to grow at a higher altitude, we're at 1500 feet, maybe that's, a, this one's a little more clay friendly. So just sort of piecing the choices together in some semi-logical way. Uh, again, with what I know now, I would have changed up a little bit of what we did, but you know, it's 65% in the ballpark, which is not bad for vineyards, so. Yeah. <laughs> you have to it's go a long process. One. And you, sorry, you said you had to go to Montana for one, or? Uh, Idaho, uh, Eastern Washington, right on. They were the only people in the U.S. that had that particular type of Sangiovese. So, road trip. <laughs> Not bad, huh? <laughs> yeah, that was worth it, actually. <laughs> I, I, I believe it would be. Washington is a whole other world, different, similar to, to California wine, but sort of on its own adventure. It's like California in 1970, 1975. Well, it's a growing wine industry that's all over the place. Cool. We uh, talk a little wine. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, what uh, what are your impressions or first impressions of the Mokali? And and I'd just love to hear your thoughts. Um, it's not whether you like or don't like. You know, we'll we'll, we'll, kind of, we'll get to that <laughs> with our, our wine of the night and stuff. But what are your what are your thoughts about the wine? This has, I, I don't, I'm, I'm interested to hear what your um, description of it is, because this is the exact type of wine that I don't like, and <laughs> it's the, the smell of it I don't like, the taste of it I don't like, and I don't know, I never know how to describe it when I taste a wine like this, I don't have that description in my vocabulary of what it is that I don't like, but I don't, definitely don't like it. All right, well, well, let's get into this. <laughs> the barnyard. There's a little barnyard on the nose. Oh, yeah. Is anyone else finding a, a little bit of barnyard that kind of earthy? That was my yeah, first. Yeah, we, we had this over two nights um, a little while ago, and it was very like savory the first night, like especially on the nose. Like it's not fruit, it's not sweet. It's like something. I wrote down beef, even though I'm not sure I'm smelling beef, but like mm -hmm. it's something savory or earthy. And then the second night, it was a lot more balanced after it had time to air out. But I had the same experience. When I smelled it, I was like, am I going to like this? And then it really changed over time. It changed a lot. Changed a lot. That's so funny. That So I, in my notes, I wrote, smells like a hearty meat stew with mushrooms. Oh. Yeah. Yes. 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 Awesome. That's why I don't have the vocabulary because I don't eat meat. So there you go. There you go. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Mushrooms, though. Me too. We love it. Mm -hmm. Yes, please, uh, Nancy. Yeah. So I thought like it's it's very earthy and kind of an inky taste, mm -hmm. but also manure like manure. <laughs> like manure. 
sometimes it's but it was pretty strong i think in the beginning earth you know so to be polite i said earthy <laughs> absolutely absolutely no no manure is good stick with the impolite please uh we're talking about a sensory experience here we got to get into the nitty-gritty who else has some thoughts about the first wine uh, we're talking about the Monica, right? The Moncali, yeah. Moncali, Moncali yeah. No, I'll, I'll get these names right. That's yeah. all right. <laughs> um, yeah. That's the Castellare, right? Castellare Moncali? Uh, no, the Moncali is the first, the blue one, and the Castellare is the white one, just to keep it uh, forward. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. I thought the Castellare, I thought the uh, the age on it was really interesting. Um, Moncali? Yeah. Yeah, Moncali, yeah. I, I thought it, it gave a, a completely different level to the wines altogether. My favorite of the of, of all three of them was the Castellare, but the, I, 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 I like the um, Moncale. Mon 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 um, and, uh, but, but the age kind of threw me a little bit, actually. Yeah. 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 For me as well, when I initially tasted it. Um, any other thoughts about this wine? <laughs> we liked it. We really liked it and kind of had the opposite experience of the first person in terms of, oh, this is always the kind of wine that I like. <laughs> not sure how to describe it, except I know that I don't like fruity wines and it doesn't taste very fruity to me. Yeah, yeah. Well, so I, you know, I think getting into the glass, and thank you very much, uh, getting into the glass, you know, this is a wine that shows earth like right off the front um, yeah. in, in kind of a very bold way. And it's a little hard to kind of get into those fruits. Um, but once you do, I feel like they, they, they drive a little bit more on the palate. Um, you know, this is such a curious wine. It was among the first wines that I tasted. Um, and uh, I, I bought a case um, because I thought it was a really interesting mix of different Sangiovese. And because of the age and the price point as well, it being relatively inexpensive. But it was kind of a unique wine for lunch and for barbecues. And I, I, all I had in mind with this wine was barbecues. Um, but <laughs> to, to, to this day, um, I've, I've never had to purchase so much of it. <laughs> and, uh, it's, it's by far the most popular wine on the list. Wow. And I don't understand why. Um, I, I find it to be curious and fun. And at that price point, I'm, I don't know about you, but I'm willing to take a chance. And, and, and wines like this are, are, especially certainly with a little bit of age, they show a lot of integration. I would think this wine in its youth had a little bit more of that punchy Amarena cherry fruit on the nose. But uh, I think age has stripped it away of that and really shown off a lot of this earthiness. It's like heavy barnyard. Um, but uh, I love hearing everyone's thoughts about this wine. I hope it's okay. <laughs> that some of us uh, don't like it. You love it. This one actually made me wonder, is there a part of the tongue that you're supposed to put this wine onto? I'm a very like new wine drinker, so I know that I vaguely understand that you're supposed to put it on some part of your tongue, but this one, I think I put it on the wrong part because it really made me <laughs> wince because it was, yeah, I like got all of the like alcohol flavors, but not any of the undertones. So is there a way that you're supposed to let it sit on your tongue in order to get all the flavors? No, no. What is your name? <laughs> oh, I'm... Tess, I am their daughter. <laughs> Pleasure to meet you. Um, no, there is not a there is not a, a, a wrong Pleasure. way to do it. Um, I uh, I remember I, I spoke to a French winemaker once when I was in New York. He had come to the restaurant to visit, and and uh, it was right about that time when those aerators were all the rage. And they still kind of are all the rage. And they're kind of like these little glass or you know whatever they're made from, and you put them on top. You know what I'm talking about, right? Um, and they kind of aerate the wine for you and then it pours it into the glass kind of runs yeah. through a series of channels and like sprays up and I remember uh, talking mm -hmm. to him about that and he looked at me like there was this incredulous look on his face and he said you have an aerator right here he said just take the wine and <laughs> never forget that um because it really uh it really took the the whole fanciness right out of it um uh, anyway I, it doesn't really answer your question but no there's you know I think there there are there are receptors on your tongue um, that are important and they, they, they mark, you know, the, the senses of taste, sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami, which are five. Um, but you don't need to be delicate with wine and make sure it hits a certain part of your tongue. Um, actually, I, I prefer you do the opposite with wine. 
take it in your palate, swish it around, almost get to the verge of mouthwash if you'd like. Um, certainly with the second wine, um, it doesn't please you. Um, and, uh, and, and the wine and the character of the grapes and the winemaker will come and the place will all come out um, as you do that and, and the rougher you are with it. So dive in head first, okay? Okay, thank you. Of course. I think it does highlight something really interesting about Sangiovese though, and that it is a really divisive grape. It's not, <laughs> it's not a wine for everybody. Yep. It's it's kind of wiry. It's kind of lean. It can be fruity, but weird. It's definitely not. I rarely find a Sangiovese that I would say is plush or super welcoming. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I'm I actually haven't been in wine all that long. 2008, I think, was when I did the full transition into it. Um, mm -hmm. And I hated Sangiovese for the first couple of years. I didn't get it. It it. It just, you know, it was generally abrasive. The tannin was angular. The acidity always seemed a little too high and a little too much. Um, I just didn't. And then I just sort of, I, at a Chianti Classico tasting, I had sort of the revelation moment of, oh my gosh, I think I get this and I might be in love. I'm not sure kind of moment. It just <laughs> changed everything for me. And, and that doesn't necessarily have, need to happen to everybody. Yeah. But it's... Yeah, it's not Barbera, it's not Montepulciano, or even those super pretty Sicilian wines. It, I, I think Sangiovese really is its own unique beast and it can go in different directions. Um, even in this bottling, I get the sense that there are some old vines mixed in here. There's some of that minerality on the back end. Yeah. I think with the age, the wine is a little bit reduced, which is pushing it into that stinky oxygen starved area that we, we talked about that a little bit during the Barbera tasting, which brings out some really unique things as well. Um, and starting out, I wouldn't, I would, I would have hated this. It, Cause it's just kind of out of reach in, in some, in some ways, but now I, I'm sort of obsessed with wines like this a little bit, <laughs> my, or, or I've just become a little bit of a grizzled old man that like less fruit in the earth, you know, it's kind of, kind of mantra. So, yeah. the, you know, the wine I think, uh, I, I think if, if it delivers at all, it delivers on the palate, um, and mm -hmm. uh, and it's it's a bit more more plush. And for some reason, I can't get like barbecue out of my mind, like having like a pork slider and then taking some of this wine. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, Sangiovese is a, a, a tough one. I, I, you know, I can only speak from restaurant experience and just, you know, palate after palate after palate. And, and I think introduction to Sangiovese, you know, in, with Brunello, um, but that, that, you know, reaches for a certain price point. Um, I think there are other producers out there. There's a producer by the name of Monte Vertine, who, make, who is a real old school practitioner of Sangiovese and blends it with Canaiolo and Colorino, so real kind of an old school producer, and they make really beautiful, pure wines. Um, but I, I think the most kind of plush, forward, like entry to the gates of Sangiovese um, might not be representative of the grape exactly, but it's Isole Olena. Uh, they make a wine called the Ceparello, and it's 100% Sangiovese aged for two years in almost new French barrique. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a beast of a wine, but it's, it can be quite beautiful in the right vintages. For me, they're more restrained vintages. So like nine and you know 12 and stuff like that. But um, I think there are over people. 50 different clones of Sangiovese in that also. Is What's that? that? I think I, there are over 50 different clones of Sangiovese. In, in that the Chaparello? Yeah, is that correct? I, I hadn't heard that, no. I, but I wouldn't put it past them. Isole Alain is an important yeah. property. Yeah, it's a huge number. Or at least twenty. Is it? I, I swear it's least twenty. Nice. That's deep. Yeah. That's that's three hundred one right there. <laughs> that's nice. Uh, so is this the is this the peasant wine of Italy? It sounds like it's ubiquitous across. A it can be. Uh, Sangiovese, the peasant wine. Yeah. Sure. I mean, I think yeah, it sounds like there's so much of it and so many different varieties of it that it's what everybody is. Everybody's got their own version of it. I think in, in, in Tuscany, you find a lot of different versions of it. Um, I, 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 I think it can be, certainly in Chianti, um, in areas in the outer areas, just the regular Chianti, not in the Classico, it can be that. But I mean, Biondi Santi, um, uh, Gianfranco Soldera, 
um, there, are, there are a lot of producers out there that have taken Sangiovese to great heights. Um, I uh, myself did a tasting of Biondi Santi back to 1952. Um, wow. it, was, uh, it was a remarkable tasting because the wines, they had reconditioned at the winery just a few years before the tasting. So they had gone with the bottles, the, the, the owner had taken the literal bottles to the winery and uh, the Biondi Santi family took them to the casks and pulled, <laughs> pulled 1952, 1955, 1958 and uh, reconditioned wow. the bottles and then recorked them for them with those vintages. Which what is, does it mean to recondition the bottles? It, it means just that. It means to basically bring the bottle back to the winery and they, they must have wine from that vintage sitting in barrel or in demi or in glass um, or whatever um, and, uh, and, and literally filling it up and conditioning that wine. Yeah. And very, very few producers do a, a procedure like that. It costs, I think, thousands of dollars at Biondi Santi to do it. But, you know, this is a family that... Uh, they, uh, you know, they, they were one of the few families that just refused to, <laughs> they walled up all their wines um, so that the, so that the Germans wouldn't touch them <laughs> in World War II. Um, they were, they were real, um, when, when, when Robert Parker was, you know, praising, you know, really inky, dark, full wines, which Sangiovese can never become because of the skins. Right, Pietro? Yeah. They never become deep and dark. Uh, the Biondi Santi family said nope, and they kept doing what they were doing. And they're, they're very, very successful. They make beautiful, absolutely beautiful wines. I don't know how I got onto the Biondi Santi. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good email list. Yeah. <laughs> All right, should we move to the Chianti? Yeah. Yes, please. All right. I guess, I guess I didn't realize that Chianti was a Sangiovese. I guess I never knew that before. Yes, <laughs> welcome to the world of Sangiovese. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, I've always liked both, but I didn't, I didn't realize it was the same grape or the region. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And if I may, just for a quick second, I, I promise not to drone on too, too long. Um, but just to, just to further clarify Sangiovese, um, pardon me while I cycle through these maps, but here we have Tuscany. Um, and a little bit cut off, but uh, there's Chianti Classico with Florence to the north um, and Siena to the south. Here is the Classico, very, very important area. Whenever you see Classico, it always means the original growing region in Italy. Um, and uh, so really beautiful Chianti. It's made up of, a, of, of several communes or villages that are kind of scattered around the outskirts here and one kind of in the center. Um, the Chianti that we have is along this area here in an area called... Uh, Castellina in Chianti. Um, then you have this area out here, which are just simply Chianti. They're not Chianti Classico. And so these are typically younger vines. These are, you know, the more inexpensive bottlings sometimes. Sometimes they can become quite beautiful and ageable, like the Rufinas or the Seneses down here near Siena. Um, but, uh, typically they're just, they're fun, aromatic, easy drinking wines. And this area here, it's known as Sangio, uh, the grape itself. Um, and this was championed by the, uh, the one the gentleman who founded Castellari in the 1970s, um, uh, Paolo Panarai. Uh, he's the one who uh, isolated the specific clone that was grown mostly throughout Chianti Classico and Chianti in general. And they referred to it as Sangio Vetto. So it's all Sangiovese, but uh, they like to, the local name they call it is San Giovetto, and it has certain characteristics in this area, but these are hills and it's slightly cooler if you were to look at it in, 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 in terms of the rest of uh, Tuscany. Um, and then following down here in Montalcino, that's also San Giovese, but it's known as San Giovese Grosso. And, it's, uh, and, and the people here in Montalcino call it Brunello. Um, and this is, uh, this is where uh, San Giovese Grosso or San Giovese is uh, aged for a minimum of five years before it's released to become a Brunello, which is very impressive. Uh, there's also the Rosso di Montalcino category, which is much less time, typically younger vines. Um, and then you have Montepulciano, uh, where uh, San Giovese has a funny name, uh, Prugnolo Gentile. And uh, this is uh, where San Giovese, I, for, you know, in my opinion, becomes a, a bit more richer, a little bit more fruit forward, a little bit more aromatic. Um, uh, or excuse me, a little bit more plush on the palate, um, being a little bit closer to Umbria. Um, and then Sangiovese's got a couple of other names. Down here in uh, Grossetto, in the town of Scansano, 
It's called Moralino. Um, as you move up here, there's Sangiovese type uh, grapes called Chiliagiolo in the Monte Cucco area. Um, and uh, let's see, where else? And there's other areas where Chianti's got funny names. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's essentially Sangiovese in Tuscany. But if you're talking about Chianti Classico, we're talking about Sangiovese. We're talking about Brunello, we're talking about Sangiovese. We're talking about Vino Noble di Montepulciano, we're talking about Sangiovese. <laughs> it's yeah. I, I, I know that the, the, the um, Super Tuscans were sort of a, a reaction to the strict requirement of Chianti and the requirements, I think, were other grapes had to be in there as well, including white grapes. I, I, I believe that changed. Can you talk about that at all? Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I think the Super Tuscans, um, and the Super Tuscans was kind of a movement in the, you know, 70s and 80s, late 70s, 80s. Um, and it was a little bit less, yet yeah, you're absolutely right in, in terms of it being uh, trying to, to fight against the Chianti model, which was, uh, you know, prevalent in the area you know, Chianti being blended in. And way back in the day, it was blended in with some inferior grapes um, like Malvasia and Trebbiano. Um, they uh, did that to uh, give it freshness and a little bit of, uh, little bit of ageability. Um, but it was, uh, I think, uh, for a lot of producers, it thinned out the Chiantis. And I'm talking about the Chiantis in baskets, <laughs> the mm -hmm. things that we saw in trattorias and, and, and in Italian, cheesy Italian restaurants growing up. Um, so uh, there were a number of producers along the Tuscan coast, um, uh, to speak specifically, uh, uh, that yes, you know, they were less interested in Sangiovese and more interested in attempting to grow Cabernet Sauvignon, to grow Merlot and Cabernet Franc, um, and they wanted to, you know, call these wines something. They wanted to, you know, they wanted to take it seriously. Um, but the DOC, which is the Italian. You know, law that prevails in, 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 in Italy um, with regards to wine uh, wouldn't allow these grapes, certainly not nothing to be blended in with Sangiovese. I mean, my goodness, um, you wouldn't want to dilute that perfect, perfect grape. Um, and so these producers rebelled. Um, and uh, instead of following the model of DOC, um, they decided to make their wines anyway, and uh, they would be declassified to Vino di Tavola, which is the cheapest designation you can get. It basically means fermented grapes from Italy. Um, and, uh, and they said, we're gonna do it anyway, in classic Italian fashion. And, and, uh, and, and you know, I'm, I'm speaking about Tenuta San Guido, um, talking about the Marchese Antonori, I'm talking about uh, uh, the Grattamaco um, estate, all in the area of Bulgari and Marema, these areas, as well as a handful of Chianti producers. Um, so uh, they decided to make their wines anyway. And uh, they, uh, these wines uh, very quickly took off and uh, eventually uh, were priced, uh, priced the Chianti, the best Chiantis and the best Brunellos out of the radar screen as they do today. Uh, Sasakaya can be upwards of six, $700 a bottle. Um, bring me a Chianti to that. Um, and uh, essentially uh, a category was forced into the government. And in 1993, I think it was, it was called the Goria Laws, where they created the stepping stone, which is what they like to call it, patronizingly enough, to DOC <laughs> and perhaps to DOCG if you could do it at once in your life. Um, but uh, the category they created was IGT, Indicazione Geografica de Pica. And uh, that was the category where the Super Tuscans kind of prevailed. Um, now IGT Toscana is an uh, open category. Now you, you can blend in other grapes into Chianti. You cannot do it with Brunello. Brunello is Sangiovese Grosso, 100%. That's it. End of story. They will fight you. Um, <laughs> what about the Castellotti? Is that 100% Sangiovese? No, it is not. It's Sangiovese and Canaiolo. So uh, you'll see these uh, other blending grapes, Canaiolo, Colorino, and another grape by the name of Malvasia Nera. And these are three grapes that when blended with Sangiovese seem to not alter its personality. They seem to, to keep Sangiovese's sturdy backbone, its dry, expressive red fruits, its nice acidity if it's managed well, um, and its depth of expression in the glass.
Thank you, thank you. Yeah. So that's Super Tuscans. Uh, now they're just called IGT Tuscana. I think Super Tuscan, the term is, has left Tuscany and now you're starting to see like Super Friulians and Piedmontians and all these crazy supers. So it's traveled. What's the blend on the Mokali? Was and then now that makes me realize that's probably not all one hundred percent Sangiovese, my friend. Notwithstanding, but uh, but Sangiovese from various areas. So there could be some Prugnolo Gentile in here. There's definitely Sangiovese Grosso. Yeah, she's good. Probably a large amount. Yeah, yeah she's to me, the, uh, to me, the Castellari has a lot more evidence of oak than certainly the other two wines and than I'm used to in San Giovese, so. You're way too crazy. Get a little bit of toast. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah. Maybe some kind of caramel or something as well from the, from the wood, so I don't know what your thoughts are on that, but uh, yeah. I thought it was, it was kind of unusual in a, in a, in a, in a Chianti. In a Chianti, yeah. You know, nowadays I'm, I'm finding a lot more French oak. These guys were doing it though a while ago. They kind of were, were, were among the, not the very first, but among the first to, to do that. Um, and, and in this particular producer uses second used 225 liter barrels. That's the barrique. That's the regular size, about yeah, big. And then he uses five hectoliter barrels as well. Um, and he uses a split of, of, of the 50-50. Um, and I, you know, I think the, the oak is there. Um, I, I, for me, uh, the, in Castellari, because of their altitude, they're around 1,200 feet or so, because of the soil, because of the way that their Sangiovese grapes are. And for me, they capture a little bit more black fruit than red. They, they have a little bit more of like a lifted personality. It's got like bright acidity. I think that for me, they marry with the oak a little bit more harmoniously and, and, and don't take away from Sangiovese like they would perhaps like Costa Nuevo Baradena, which is to the southern part of Chianti where some of the wines there can get really heavy and full and the oak just absolutely overpowers them. Um, so for me, the, the lift, uh, the altitude the, and what that brings helps. Um, for me, yeah. Um, but yeah, the presence of oak is, 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 is absolutely there. <laughs> Folks, when we're talking about oak, you know, we're talking about, you know, it's, it's like baking spice aroma. It could be a little bit of vanilla could be a little bit of dill, you know, things like that, just kind of like that other aroma, apart from just the grape. For sure. To the camera. <laughs> Any other impressions about the Castellari? I like it. <laughs> was that Dana? <laughs> yeah, it was. I, I, I enjoy that one. Good. I like it too. Dana, I'm glad I can bring you to such extremities. <laughs> I had a heck of a time getting my cork out of this one, though. I mean, like, the cork was, like, really super sticky on this one. Was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it was. Yeah. What does that mean? And the, and the top started to crumble a little bit. Yeah. Oh. So, yeah, yeah. Same over here. How is the wine? Is it okay? No, it's good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I looked in there, and I, you know, I got all the little crumbles out, and I, you know, put, my, um, put a napkin around the rim of it and was able to clean it out. But, yeah, the wine's good. Did yeah. anyone else have that experience? You have that experience? Toss, you did? Yeah. Yeah. Cynthia oh, couldn't else? it. I, I figured it out. My cork was clean. Okay. David, did you guys? Ours is fine. Yours was, it's so interesting. So weird. Okay. Wow. No. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. Make sure the wine is good. Yeah, Nancy? I, I don't. <laughs> hold on. I'm sorry. Uh, let's see. Okay, I, I did like this one a lot. Um, I thought it was had a burnt wood scent and tobacco. Mm. Yes, Kinda. that's wood. Yeah, that's oak you're talking. Yeah. About. So it was, it was good. I I, I I like this one better, you know, than the first one. And the first one. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Oh. That oak is really showing up in the glass for you as yeah. well. Yeah. Well, here's some other thoughts about the Castellari. So we're having the opposite experience over here once again, which is really liked the first one. Okay. And this one is probably like, uh, you know, as a group, our least favorite. And wouldn't be disappointed if I ordered it at a restaurant, but um, it's my least favorite of the three. And, and I can't, because I don't really know how to describe wine very well, I don't know what, how to 
how to say it, but to me it tastes, um, bear with me here, but like it's like a watered down Kool-Aid. <laughs> oh. Okay, all right. <laughs> all right. Are we all in agreement there at the Jennifer residence? Uh, Jennifer is off in the kitchen, but... Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> I, this is uh, Deidre and Adam. Yeah. I'm Tim. Hi, hi Deidre. Hi, hi guys. We, we could, Jen and I couldn't drink two bo three bottles by ourselves, so we invited two friends over. <laughs> yeah, you're not alone. <laughs> and uh, our, our... I mean, actually, I like all of them a lot, but uh, I tend to agree. This one, uh, it, it's... it's um, it so it feels blended to a, a level that the others aren't, you know. Like uh, I have to say, the uh, the, the third wine, uh, the Prima Materia, is actually the most complex. Mm. In my opinion. Mm, uh, great. This this one um, has a little bit of uh, as it comes together, it becomes almost a little too smooth, which is what I think Deidre is referring to as as a Kool Aid. Yeah. Flavor. I think it's the. Um, the acid, the tart, I think oh, it yeah. seem like. Could be, yeah. Yeah. Could be. <laughs> Typically, though, <laughs> when you get that, I hear like a string no. like, what? Is that? <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Thank you for your thoughts. <laughs> yeah. If I can make an observation, I, and this is sort of a dilemma with Sangiovese that I'm, I'm facing and will face next week. You get, with, with aging in normal sized barrels, um, you get more polished tannin. You, it might have, uh, for me, it, it's much more fine grained with that delicate chalkiness. But it's sort of, the trade off is the fruit and the purity is a little bit diminished from that slow oxygenation you get through a barrel. And it's a big struggle, um, again, to like get the tannin where it's sort of relaxed a little bit, but still present without losing the sort of sense of purity. Um, I find the, the Mokali has a little more purity, but the tannins rougher around the edges. It's a little more, you know, it has a, uh, I don't know what the aging is on that, but I, I would imagine there's not too much barrique on it. This one here, it's a, it's yeah. a whole mix of weird barrels. It's like yeah. three sentences long, 30% gotta be a ton of low, 30%. It's thirty percent new, thirty percent one, thirty percent two, and then a and then a large barrel. Oh, there's that much new on it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it actually holds it pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. For San Giovese, without obstructing it. Oh. Is it the one? Hmm. Nice. But again, integration though, Pietro, with this one. Yeah, time. Two thousand sixteen. It's got a little bit of love. Yeah, to it. yeah. magic of time. Yeah. But the Castellari, for me, it shows that that sort of dilemma of do you polish it up or do you keep it like pure and rough. Mm. And it's it's a, it's a question. It has yeah. it has some of those more leathery aspects mm -hmm. that I really like in it. Um, the Mokali kind of moves that leather to barnyard a little bit, maybe for some people, kind of in that mushroom dank direction. A lot less sturdy. A lot less sturdy. Yeah, because it, it's got more backbone, I think, than anything. Yeah, it's an interesting dialogue between the two, though. Yeah, you know, yeah. sort of showing poles that are really really interesting. I think. Yeah. Yeah. I've got a, uh, a Chianti from a producer named E. Fabri. It's from a, a, a kind of a, a newish appellation in Chianti called La Mole. And uh, they make a stainless steel and it's the highest altitude. I think it's like 1,400 feet or something like that, or 1,500 feet. I think it's a, it, they call it the roof of Chianti. Um, and uh, and they, they make us really air. And that's all stainless steel where it really preserves the fruit component of Sanchovese. Um, yeah. Yeah. We almost compared it in a certain way. There's a, I mean, it's obviously much more complex, uh, but the, the lightness, the light part of it reminded us of a schiava almost. You know, it's like in the, it's just something that we would just drink very casually. Of the, uh, the, the Castellare? Yeah. Oh, you know, you, you may be, it, may, it might be the altitude, uh, the elevation, and showing a lot of bright acidity. Uh, and a lot of kind of, they have kind of a firm, focused feel to it, apart from the oak. I do like this. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else feel it's, uh, it, it, it's like a chillable red? <laughs> like schiava? I feel like it has a little bit more sturdiness to it. So for me, um, the, the food and which I usually enjoy, but actually I like the 
a te- Casta Lare more. And because I smell, like when you smell it, I smell like candy plums or prunes. And so there's um, sort of a interesting smell to it. And when you taste it, it's just really smooth, but it's still really complex. Good. And um, and maybe it works, it makes you work. I mean, it comes off just really smooth and easy to drink. And so that's dangerous. But also it makes you work a little bit to try to sort of figure out the finesse that's behind it. And when I first opened it, you taste a lot more of that, which then has softened out over time. So there's a lot more sort of fruit and acid that comes more forward. And then, but now it's like dampened, not dampened, but just softened. A little more in the background. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I agree, I agree. If I can, uh, if I can ask Pietra to talk a little bit more, I, I thought it was really interesting that kind of the trade-off in uh, softening the, the the tannins against kind of losing some of the clarity, um, and and the extra dimension I'd love to, to hear his thoughts about are uh, on ripe kind of ripe vintages. I've noticed like some recent vintages in in Tuscany, like 2015, which seem very ripe to me, and I feel like both of those things are being lost. Uh, both the kind of tannin and the clarity are being lost in favor of just like a very fruit forward I- experience. And I'm wondering if that's, if that is indeed the vintage and, or if that's maybe a stylistic thing that's changing in the area. It could be stylistic, but if uh, I actually, I have not been keeping up on bad, bad Italian and not <laughs> keeping up on my vintages uh, over there, but yeah, 2015 was hot. I'll, all through, I believe. Um, generally, with a hotter vintage, you get more jam up front and more uh, more maturity in the tannin, maybe. Maybe less ageability. So it might be more jammy and accessible up front, but might not have the longevity. It's sort of a general rule of thumb, but, but there are so many winemaker choices and vineyard choices that can affect that. It's hard to say definitively. Um, but yeah, that's one of the, uh, again, going back to just the peculiar nature of Sangiovese, when it gets overripe, it sort of stops being Sangiovese and becomes a cherry red grape <laughs> in a lot of ways, yeah. without a whole lot of, and this is, the, typically among California winemakers, they hate Sangiovese because they call it a donut wine, because there's a big hole in the middle. It's lacking mid palate. it's very much sort of acid up front and then tannin on the back, really chalky, uh, with nothing in between. And I think that's, you know, kind of Sangiovese's beautiful nature, but for the wine makers who are actually creating something, uh, you can kind of fill that in by getting the grapes more ripe, but it's at the expense of other features. Yeah. Like you won't get those savory notes. You won't get those earthy tones. You won't, sometimes Sangiovese can be uh, almost metallic and iodine in some ways, uh, kind of like Ionico can be, which is something I love in it, but we don't get a whole lot of that in California because our grapes are just so ripe generally through our summers and our vines are younger. That's, a, that's another feature too that's, that's difficult in the equation. But yeah, hotter vintages, more fruit is is the simplest way to think about it. More fruit, less acid. So, so pro- probably just a, a a vintage thing. I'm not a, a winemaker choice. If anything, I c- kind of see people are pulling back on the oak a little bit and pulling back on the ripeness, not just California, but globally now. I'm not sure the pendulum may already be, you know, every five years styles change. It's just the way it is. <laughs> Um, God bless somebody like Castellari that's been doing the same thing for, for years and years. Uh, but it's worth pointing out too, just, and Paul can maybe speak more to this, but you know, your Chiantis were 10, 15% white grapes up until what, the mid seventies, mm-hmm. 1980, you know, this sort of purity of Sangiovese that, that mm-hmm. is kind of a, kind of a meta goal. It, it wasn't always that way. It's a fairly new phenomenon. It was sort of like rediscovering the beauty of the past kind of thing. Um, there was a lot of really bad Sangiovese for a long time. And it's the most planted grape in Italy, north to south. People throw all, there are a few uh, 
DOC blends with Sangiovese as part of that, mm -hmm. like Rocco Piceno and uh, Camaro, but largely a standalone grape that needs purity. And that's, you know, when it's 15% Malvasia and 10% Colorino, and I think it just needed to be 75% Sangiovese in a lot of areas up until the 70s. Is that correct, Paul? Uh, I actually, I have to look at it. It's kind of a new, I, I, kind of a new yeah, game. Seventy or seventy-five percent. I, 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 I think it would. They could blend upwards of 20 percent. So maybe it was eighty. Yeah, maybe. So regardless, even with a small amount of Trebbiano and Malvasia, it changes the. Yeah, that's kind of rad. Changes out the nature of Sangiovese. Yeah. yeah. So I think it, they kind of didn't realize the diamond that they had. Oh. My well, thought. A, a few of them did, though. I mean, a few of them did. The though, yeah. Santi family. This guy. Uh, for Castellari, he started, I mean, he bought these, this vineyard in the mid 1970s and was San Giovetto all the way. Um, I think for, for me, as a, a, when I'm looking at wines now as a purchaser, but as a former restaurant son, it was, you know, with, when it comes to vintage in, in Barolo and Barbaresco, I was a little bit more careful on where I was in terms of vineyards and things. So, like 2014 and, and Barolo was a very harrowing vintage. But there are a lot of amazing wines out there. You just have to find them. Um, in Tuscany, I'm a little bit more. Um, I yes. hold my arms to the producer a bit more. Um, so if it's a warm vintage, a producer like Castellare or or like Montevertine or Isole Elena, those guys will manage their the vigor of their vines, and they'll tend not to produce super overripe grapes. So I know I'm going to get as much of a balanced expression as they can in that vintage. Um, yeah, that's just my two cents. But yeah, 2015 was hot, and really, um, there was a, a, a lot of uneven ripening all over. Sorry, I have a question about the Chianti blending. Are, are, so are Chianti's allowed to blend now, but they just don't? Yeah. Much or did it change? They, okay. yeah, they can, yeah, Merlot, they can blend in other grapes, small percentage. Yeah. So it's I it's, not, that it's okay. not that they're not blending, but maybe they're, they're just being a little wiser about what they are blending they in. They can't blend white grapes, which, is a, big, which is a big big first first rule that they put in there's no yeah. white grapes yeah yeah it's an interesting thing though because you know a producer that's going to blend in merlot has a different set of ethos than somebody that's doing 100 percent sangiovese yeah i just i'm not saying the one is better than the other but that kind of plays along with paying attention to the producers and finding the ones that you know that you hold on to over time yeah mm -hmm. there's a yeah. lot of yeah a lot of uh, finding your finding your go on yeah. another really good chianti producer that i i love is fun todi f-o-n-t-o-d-i and they make a really solid chianti year in year out um or at least for the last several several years that i've been tasting and they've been just like a nice through line. Yeah. Yeah. Sure you want to uh, jump into your uh, your 2016 and talk a little bit about? Yeah. About that. Um, just for the sake of completeness, I'll just throw out a 90 second history of California Sangiovese. Yeah. Um, it first showed up in 1863 in Sonoma, uh, Agastan Exazathi out there, uh, Buena Vista Winery. He brought in like 500 different types of grapevines. It was called San Giovedo then, just like mm -hmm. what was back in the old days. What was that? Uh, he planted it and nothing came of it. Nobody cared. So fast forward about 25 more years and the Italian Swiss colony, uh, which I mentioned during the Barbera tasting, um, they, are, they were in Sonoma County up by Cloverdale. They created a red blend with a lot of Sangiovese in it, which became their, their main wine. They actually became the biggest producer in California for a while. In 1900, 1890. Um, and then it kind of, it went downhill a little bit, heading towards Prohibition. Uh, there were little bits of Sangiovese here and there, but it was being a really difficult grape, so nobody went all in on it. 
Uh, Prohibition happened in 19, let me think, uh, in 1990, I wrote down a little note here, California produced a whole 70 tons of Sangiovese. That's all of California for the whole year. So not much was going on with Sangiovese post-Prohibition. Uh, there was a little bit being produced in the Sierra foothills and a guy called uh, down in Paso uh, Caparone Winery was producing you know, maybe 400 cases. He was actually labeling it Brunello then because we didn't have the labeling laws that we have in place now. Can you see acid taste perception? But it was really just sort of a sideshow. Um, but then something weird happened. So Paul mentioned Tignanello and Sasakaya and some of these new Super Tuscans. Uh, Napa Valley was really exploding. Italian winemakers were coming over. And even some Americans were heading over to Italy and wine was sort of hitting this modern place. And in mid 1990s, Napa started planting a bunch of Sangiovese. They were convinced it was going to be the next thing. Uh, Cabernet and Merlot had blown up and with the sort of super Tuscan idea, they thought, oh, Napa can do it better. Why not? And some of the Italian producers came over and invested in, in projects in Napa Valley, uh, specifically up on Atlas Peak is, was one of the biggest. But even Robert Mondavi in late 1990s built a whole winery concept around Italian varietals only, making Barbera and Sangiovese. So they planted all these grapes and started making wine 1997, 1998, the wines came out. Of course, they're going to be great. You've got the biggest stars in Italy producing them, $100 bottles, and they were terrible. Uh, the critics really panned them. Too much oak, big hole in the middle, astringent, too much acid, really unpleasant. So this whole Calatal wine in the period of about eight years exploded. Uh, suddenly, there were... I think 6,000 tons of Sangiovese in Napa Valley planted and, or crushed in 1999. And then it all just collapsed and sort of went away. And uh, what was, what well, even I am, I am sucked under the Calatal category, trying to make Italian varietals in California. And uh, that whole thing, including Robert Mondavi, sort of tarnished the, even the idea of labeling something as Sangiovese in California or Nebbiolo, or even varietal Barbera for a long, long time, We're just sort of emerging out of that. So happily, that's a generation ago. Uh, in 2019, there were 1,000 tons of Sangiovese crushed in California. So about 250 acres, not a whole lot, uh, but slowly growing and being made more responsibly, I'm happy to report. So. And for me, planting five different types was a form of hedging, just in case, because they gave it, you could move a couple pieces, a couple of different places to create the final blend. So that's the, the quick, quick and dirty overview. California just hasn't done very well with Sangiovese. It doesn't like a heavy hand with winemaking. And it may not even really be for the California palate in general, but I think that's changing over these last 10 years. And I think we are kind of rediscovering Italian wines as well on the West Coast. I'm happy to report. Um, so our Sangiovese, uh, there, yeah, I think 2016, the Biondi Santi clone was not yet really producing anything. But the other four types are all in here. They're all roughly 25%. Uh, this is age 23 months in neutral oak barrels. There's a little bit of whole stem in here. Um, and in fact, some of that, the uh, grapes were destemmed, and I dried some of the stems and then added them back to the fermentation, just sort of playing with a couple of techniques. Mm -hmm. uh, the thought being the, you know, it's kind of a Burgundian thing. They tend to do that a lot with Pinot Noir, uh, Grenache mm -hmm. is another one that can be done with, um, uh, just sort of add some spice notes and kind of stamp down the fruit a little bit. Uh, we do that in Jivu, I think. In the southern uh -huh. part of Burgundy and in uh, uh, Chalons, they do that in Givry. Have you have ever had yeah. wine from Givry? Yeah, because they have that wonderful, like stemmy, like you know. Hopefully, it's more of a sort of pepper and phenolic and a little bit of lift to the palate, and 
if you do too much of it, for me, it, it tastes like green stem. So there's definitely a too much can be too much. Sure. sure. Uh, especially, it depends on where your vineyard is, what the altitude is, what the ripeness is, a bunch of different things. So I'm, I'd, I'd rather not go too far and figure it out in the future and then do too much off the front. But right now, 100% whole cluster, whole stem, foot stomp is very much in style. Um, and there's a little bit of that in here, but it's only about 15%. I'm a traditionalist, so pretty conservative. Cool. So these were all picked. Uh, I think this year they were all, 2016, I think the, they were harvested all four within 17 days of each other. So some a little ripening a little bit before the others. The Brunello clones were last. They like a little more heat, a little more ripeness because they have more tannin. Fermented separately, then combined. I don't think I left anything out in this year from what was harvested. Mm. Hey, Pietro, would you talk about how you chose your sites? I mean, you're kind of, I don't, I don't know if you're early to Lake County. It's a fascinating area, but I'd just be yeah. curious how you chose your land. Oh, I didn't. Uh, it's a family piece of property, and we pull out walnut trees and plant vineyard. So... <laughs> Yeah, it was, you know, if I had my way, I would probably be looking at a little more altitude, a little more rock content in the soil. Lake County is pretty hot. Um, so, you know, I'd love to have a cool climate plot somewhere else, but everything is just one 12 acre vineyard that we have. And it's just outside of Kelseyville uh, in the Kelsey Bench ADA that you can see kind of in the middle of the map there. Any smoke issues? Are you? Did you have to deal? Are you dealing with that? Uh, uh, that's yeah. That's the question of the day. I was supposed to ask that. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I uh, can't get around that. Um, in 2018, we had the Lake County or the Mendocino Complex fire, which uh, is still barely the largest fire in California, and that wrapped all the way around the lake and burned for 42 days. Um, so even now, and we're getting a lot of a lot of smoke from, of course, the, the uh, Napa fires and the Sonoma County fires. Um, I still don't think it's as bad as it was in 2018. So my, my fingers are crossed. Um, I, I won't be, there are some things you don't do if there's the possibility of smoke taint, like you don't do whole cluster, you don't add stems back. You try to do shorter fermentations. Um, you don't use as much press wine. So I'm, I'm still kind of deciding where I'm at with all of that. But fortunately, since I got through the 2018 vintage, I have a little bit of experience to work with. Um, more delicate grapes like Grenache, they showed smoke. Um, the fire stopped about 20 miles away. And it turns out that the proximity to the fire is very important for the type of smoke, smoke taint or smoke residue you get. Um, so it's, it's actually not quite as dangerous this year as it was when the fire was one mile away in 2018. So I will send stuff to the lab, get a number. I test, I taste stuff religiously. Um, and we'll just have to see what we get. Yeah. And in fact, when I tested the 2018, I, I bottled our 2018 Sangiovese a couple months ago. Uh, I had a couple of friends helping me bottle, had them taste it. And I sent it to the lab, did my $300 test, got my numbers back uh, below sensory threshold. There's a little bit in there, but none of us could get it, but it can evolve in the bottle because it's, it's an acidic medium and molecules can just break apart over time. Uh, so I, I decided it was just, it was damn good wine. Um, 2018 was hot and then it got like perfect 84 degree days for all of September. It was like the best Sangiovese weather I could ask for in California. Uh, so I'm. When did you pick? I'm sorry. When did you pick? Uh, it actually, because August was super hot, and we got to early September, I was like, "Oh man, this is going to be just an avalanche of heat-stressed grapes that need to come in now." And then all of a sudden, we got cloudy, cool days. It nice. Leveled it off. Yeah, leveled it off, slowed things down. And I think 2018 was actually like 2016, where it was this 17 to 20 day period of picking the different types, was able to really focus on them. Uh, most things went into the blend. There's one little bit that I just got a little bit too astringent. But um, 
and I kept the press part separate, which allowed me to do some other experiments with things. Um, yeah, so if, if smoke doesn't appear in the wine, it, it should be a damn good vintage. We'll just have to see though. We'll have to see. Roll the dice. Um, yeah, but uh, so 23 months in barrel. And this is one thing that we get more fruit in California. So I'm a little more comfortable with 23 months in small barrel than I might be if I was over in Italy as far as just preserving up fruit front, if that's a goal. I feel like this came through 23 months in pretty good condition, polishing off the tannin, but still maintaining a lot of that red fruit front and center. So, yeah. but I haven't tasted it in a few weeks, so here we go. Here we go. Yeah, it's got a lot of... Yeah, just a real piece of lion's paws. Do they have the tannin? Reminds me of camping. <laughs> any other uh, any other thoughts, questions about Sangiovese? Ideas? So it was interesting that you, <clears throat> in the very, very beginning, I forget which one of you, but compared, um, it may have been Pietro, who compared Sangiovese, or maybe Paul, that sort of compared a little bit to Pinot. So to me, uh, this Sangiovese reminds me, anyway, of Pinot's from Big Nation slash Santa Cruz Nation, but with hmm. Interesting. I can see that. So yeah. I very much enjoy it. And it's just really soft, easy to drink, and would just go with a variety of foods. So yeah. thank you. And I missed the very last thing you said. You said with Pinots from Santa Cruz, but with something. Uh, so I said, um, it reminds me of Pinots from Big Basin slash Santa Cruz Mountains. With, oh, with more spice. And so it was interesting when, Pietro, you talked about how you fermented it or aged, uh, fermented, right, with more um, the dried stems. Yep. And so when initially, my notes were when I initially wrote it was that it was a little bit of um, sort of grab on mm -hmm. it, but that softens out and which I attribute to either coming from the skin and or the stem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's yeah. super perceptive. Yeah, um, it was Pietro who initially mentioned the connection to Pinot. Um, I'm in total agreement that, you know, there's a few like grapes they happen to be all the grapes that I love uh, that are these thin-skinned, finicky, pain in the half grapes. And it's Sangiovese, Pinot Noir, and Nebbiolo. Um, and there are others, but those are kind of the big three. The big three that, uh, that have the hardest time but represent place the most. So they, they, they can often be like the most transparent. Yeah. So um, I, I always like to try and think of them together, whereas Grenache and, you know, Cab and more low and they're very different grapes, thicker and meaner and fuller. <laughs> yeah. I like, uh, you know, I, I, I agree with the spicy character with Pietro's wine. It's, it was when I first met Pietro um, was at Vintage Berkeley in Elmwood and we just struck up a conversation and uh, talked to him a little bit about what I was doing. And he just, without a second, handed me a bottle of his Sangiovese and said, take this home and try it. Um, and, it, and, I, and I had it with my brother, um, Tostu. No, actually, no, I had it on my own. Sorry, it was before Tosca. Um, and uh, I, d I remember that spicy characteristic, um, that, you know, kind of this mix of like bacon spice and like crushed crushed herbs and flowers and things. And um, it's so interesting because I get a little bit of that in Tuscan Sangiovese. Um, but I, I, in California Sangiovese, I get that a lot more. I really like how harmonious it is with the fruit in this glass. It doesn't kind of overpower it. It kind of like seeps back together. Kind of like they lay down together really well. Um, yeah, I agree, James. It's got a, got a nice kind of a soft complexion and it drinks easy, but that spicy character, I think, gives you a little bit of a finish and you can play around with that a little bit. With um, I wouldn't throw too much spice in with this wine, like, Calabrian chili thing like that, I'd avoid that stuff. I'd, mo I'd go more for savory and weight, um, like, you know, ragu bolognese and things like that. Um, 
I think this wine would be lovely with, you know, you know, like roasted chicken with a balsamic reduction. And so that kind of roasted quality, a little bit of the sweetness brings out a little bit of these, uh, of, of, of the balsamic notes that Sangiovese sometimes can have. Um, I'm not sure I'm getting the balsamic here. <clears throat> More of a Maybe a little bit. Vegetarians grilled um, cauliflower. What's that? Maybe for the vegetarians, grilled cauliflower. Absolutely, yeah. Grilled cauliflower. Um, if you can get some like the onion and shallot, and you know, if you can slow roast those to give it a little bit of character. Um, yeah, Romanesco is wonderful. Uh, if you can still find beef at root vegetables like turnips, things like that. I don't know what's out there right now, but I saw one turnip yesterday that I almost bought. Um, California is a weird place. I love it. <laughs> Being from New York, you know, we were stuck on the seasons, but here in California, everything has two or three seasons. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, yeah. I just cooked some, uh, um, I have to get the package. They're green flagellate beans. Have you ever had flagellate beans? They're yeah, like, like the herring oh, Fagiole, but uh, yeah, fagiole, Harry Covey, right? The little guys, right? Dry, the little, yeah. They're tiny little green nubbins. I think I don't think I have the, the word right. I'll look it up and send oh, you. Oh, the dried beans, the green dried beans. Yeah. Oh, obviously you don't Eric Covey. I don't. Yeah. No, and they cook like right. I'll, I'll get the name and email you, James. But I, I had it um, just this uh, just uh, yesterday, and I, I chopped it with a little bit of red cabbage, and that was really nice. You might want to drink with that. I'd want to eat with this. Yeah. So I just, for this tasting, I made beef, and I won't say which part because it might roast people up, but I made beef with shallots. And, yeah. So I made beef with shallots, and it went perfectly with the wines. That is a dangerous option, man. Beef tongue lingua. Wow. That's awesome. I think that's awesome. Yeah. So there are there are some Barberas that 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 I think only match well. Oh, Barbera. <laughs> Why did you say Barbera? What a great pairing. What a great pairing. <laughs> Paul. Yeah. I really like the last two, the Castellari and the Prima Materia. Yes. Um, I like a more fruit forward, and so I'm wondering if the woman that in the beginning didn't like that wine mm. she likes more yeah. forward but um it could be yeah you, you might be onto something yeah i i, I enjoyed it forward. but i did prefer i do prefer the other two got it got it should we do a wine of the night everyone go around talk about uh what struck yeah. them First one. all right yeah john who would like to start should i should i call people out should, should we be really structured about this? No, all right, I won't. <laughs> I like all right, the someone Chianti start. The best. <laughs> What's that? I like the Chianti the best. The Chianti, the Cla yeah. Castellari. Why is that? I don't know. Um, I think all of us here preferred three. We like the Prima Materia the best. Prima Materia all the best. All five of us, yeah. All five of you. <laughs> it was a strong vote. Good, good. You know where to find it. <laughs> we do. Love us here, Prima Materia. Prima Materia. Yeah, we love the complexity. It had more layers. A little more layers. Very nice. Yeah. Pairing next to your food. Yeah. Mary, any thoughts? I think you're on audio, my darling. Close. But, but, um, yeah, I, I'm kind of going along with everybody. I'm, I've, I've really been enjoying the Prima Materia. Good. And um, I, the Castellari was interesting. The Numero Uno, where, what, where is it gone? <laughs> Whatever that one was. Well, yeah, not so much. Well, but yeah, so the, I thought Prima Materia is coming through very, very nicely. Very nice. Yeah, I like the fruit in it. Excellent. Mm. Excellent. Anyone else? I know there's a few. Yes, I, um, I'm with Dana's group, and I, um, I, I <laughs> only like the very first one. Mm. That is the only one I like. I don't know. My taste buds are completely off from everybody else in this room, but um, no, I like the first 
from? Said, They're yours. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's um, it's it's it's. I like the earthiness of it. It's very drinkable to me. The other ones, um, the Prima Materia seems too heavy for me. Uh, tonight, you know, tomorrow, I can't say, but tonight it's a too heavy for me. Um, and the second one, I just, um, I was like Dana, and be like, oh, I don't like this wine. I don't even want to touch it. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Paul, yes. I, I, I like uh, the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and Nirvana and <laughs> appreciated very much the differences of them. I don't feel any compulsion to pick a favorite. I'd go home yeah. with any of them. Go great. home with any of them. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I've never thought that was a fair comparison, you know, because like the Beatles were too. only around for a few short years and the Rolling Stones are still going, and they're all still, you know, most of them are still alive, so, you know. The Beatles are still the best. It yeah. just means that some of it spent more time in the barrel. Well, oh. technically, the Beatles <laughs> are still going. It's just separated into pieces. Mm. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Can I bring up one other uh, thing and a question? Yeah, absolutely. When uh, we first tasted the wines, I liked the cream materia the least. And by the end, I liked it the most. In the very beginning, it felt like the different flavors were not, uh, they were fighting each other. And by a half hour later, they were all kind of working together. Absolutely. Um, and you know, it's, I think, uh, I have just two thoughts if I might jump in. Uh, one is that uh, I think very much, you know, the atmosphere that you have and and I think out of all your setting looks the most idyllic um, right now. <laughs> the sun's thing and just beautiful. Um, but I think the setting, the progression of food, the conversation, the laughing, you know, all these things, they, uh, they, they alter your experience. Um, and and I, I think that's one thing, but but, but also <laughs> large part, the wine evolves in the glass. <laughs> Gateway wine has evolved from when I first opened it. And, it and I urge you all to save, if you can, save a little bit for tomorrow. Um, <laughs> I think all of these wines will go through a change, over, <laughs> even with a cork. And, <laughs> and they'll be uh, they'll be a little bit different. A uh, little bit more integrated, um, and uh, show you the I think the length of these grapes, the evolution of these grapes. What do you think about that, Pietro? Yeah, uh, Sangiovese is a surprisingly sturdy grape for this kind of finicky, thin skin thing. Like, yeah, I, next day I, I find the oak is really coming out of the Mokali now. Uh, the Castellano has changed as well. Uh, yeah, they're they're still moving. Very much. Yeah, absolutely. And I think well-made wine will do that. <laughs> well-made wine will stand up. Yeah, it's a living thing. It really oh, is. I remember that. Yeah. Just as your palate is a living thing. Yeah. I love in Dana's group up there, how uh, she said, you know, maybe tomorrow I might think different. I think you're absolutely dead on. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to say, unlike most people, I am alone, and so therefore, for me, it's a long weekend, so it's going to be one bottle a day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> me too, man, me too. <laughs> Thank you. But yeah, so <clears throat> I would say, I, I, but I love what the David group or screen said, which is all three had such sort of personality and you know for the first one I could it's it's like drinking portobello mushrooms that are grilled <laughs> and have some like spices on it and so that's going to be interesting how it turns out and then the other two uh just much smoother with different expressions of the grape and so it's just fascinating to learn about and actually taste the different expressions of one single variety. Yeah. Yeah. Single grape, right? Yeah. yeah. I, I found it kind of um, challenging. Yeah. What was that? Say that again, Daniel? Oh, I was, I was going to I was going to sum it up by saying I'm going to send home the first one with Alex and Suzanne, and I'm going to keep the next two. <laughs> 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 that sums it up for me.
Fair enough. Fair enough. Daniel, did you have something to say? Where'd you go? Daniel. Get back here. Back. There he is. Uh, I was just going to say, I found, you know, with that kind of that analogy of the, the Rolling Stones and Beatles, and like, I found it actually really challenging to compare these three wines side by side because it was, I, I thought Pietro's description of, you know, big hole in the middle, the donut thing. It's like all these things that are kind of that have that hole in the middle. And I found all the wines um, kind of fatiguing. Like they're all like really tannic and my mouth felt like rubber, <laughs> you know, putting them all side by side. But um, so I just, I thought that was kind of interesting that it was like kind of hard to pick out some of these things after a while. And I think it's, you know, I think if I put a Sangiovese next to a, you know, something that had that hole filled, I really do like the Sangiovese characteristics. I like the kind of smoky and the, uh, and the tannic quality and um, the jamminess. Um, but that was just like a, a kind of challenging thing that just to actually put these three by each other because it was like, they all had this kind of, they're, they're unusual. I don't know. Yeah. I, I personally, I find Sangiovese an exhausting grape. It's, yeah. it's like, it's, I find it very intense and wound up and wiry and like, I, I want to say athletic, but it's more like sinewy and it's, yeah, it, it has a peculiar lack of yeah. to it <laughs> that I find exhilarating, but I'm totally with you that it's, I find it intellectually fatiguing. In yeah. Some way. yeah. Interesting. But, yeah. yeah, just to go like heavy meta with it. It's hard to play her. I don't know if Paul feels the same way. I'm, I'm curious to know how to viscerally respond to it. I, but I also, you know, I think Sangiovese is, uh, is as complicated as it, it, the more age Sangiovese is, is wild. I never know quite what to expect. Um, <laughs> certainly, Brunello. You know, stuff that has a little bit of age, seven, 10, 15 years, something like that. You know, these, these wines, get, they get, they're so wily. I never know quite what to expect with Sangiovese. Uh, with Nebbiolo, I, I don't know. I feel like I can track it a little bit better. But uh, Pinot Noir, I, I haven't had that much experience with, you know, old Pinot Noir. But uh, I feel like it's a little more put together, certainly being from France. But Sangiovese is a little bit of a wild card. Um, yeah, I guess those are my two cents. <laughs> I think I it's a bit way on your the way. So for me, I I that's what I love about Sangiovese, and also that's what I really enjoy about Pino as well, which is such a different expression depending on where it's grown. Yeah. Well, like the clone of it, which I don't know much about, the clone of it, where it is from, the climate and the geography, and then how the winemakers sort of deal with it. And so, whereas there's other varietals that have things that you can expect. And so it depends on what your approach is to wine. So for me, what I love is going on Wikipedia and clicking around and just going into a rabbit hole of 20 different tabs and then creating 50 more different tabs. And so I like things like San Giovese because you can never really figure it out. Well said. I agree. This is my humble opinion. <laughs> no, that's good. Oh, absolutely. I agree. Sanjavese keeps us on our toes. Well, good. Any other thoughts out there? Yeah. Um, I actually was a little late to the show, so I have not tried the Prima Materia. Pietro, I'm looking forward to trying this with the meal tomorrow. Oh, perfect. Um, but the uh, Piagioni, um, was definitely heavy on the uh, horse manure aroma in the beginning. <laughs> and I really felt like I was cycling uh, in Central Park again. Um, <laughs> in but um, it's slowly hey. opening up. I mean, I agree about just the, you know, kind of um, complexity of Sangiovese. Um, I don't really understand it. And Paul, we drink a lot more Nebbiolo. Yeah. Um, but so we've been bouncing between that and the Chianti and, um, the Chianti definitely is a little more fruit forward. Uh, so it's, I think, a little more of a crowd pleaser. Um, but I think this is the uh, Piagione is challenging me right now. Um, so, cool. Yeah. Challenging Thank you for your thoughts. Cool. I love it. You know, so many different palettes here. Um, mm. This call. Uh, <laughs> a, lot, a, lot of different, a lot of different thoughts. It's great. I mean, the same way than Dana, I think. 
I couldn't, I couldn't try. I mean, I tried the mokoli and I didn't like the aroma. I like the taste, but not the aroma. The aroma is like, I just, I can't. And I really like the Chianti, uh, Chianti Classico, I like it. I like the citrus and the stone in that one. Mm. Yeah. yeah, nice aromas. Yeah. Cool. Good. Somebody has lovely crickets. Um, Somebody does. <laughs> we got crickets. It's Mary. I got crickets. Mary. Yeah. Oh, cool. I, I, I have a question. Paul. Cool. Yeah. Um, and Pietro, and anyone. <laughs> Um, you know, you, you talk about like some of the wines we had like the other night, it's like, make sure you decant it for an hour or so before yeah. and so on. Um, I opened these wines up about an hour before we sat down, but I didn't decant them or anything. But what I'm hearing about the changes is, it sounds like they would be worth opening up earlier and decanting. That's what we should do next time. I think I don't, I don't think it would hurt the wines. Um, I, I think a wine like Moncali, um, I don't think it's a wine that's going to live forever in a decanter. I'd be afraid that it would it would rush it to its peak. Um, yeah, I, I might prefer the Moncali in the bottle just for that slow. I mean, really, I, I, it's it's hard for me to talk about any Italian red and say don't decant because yeah. I decant almost everything. Um, so I think it's fine, Mary. I don't think you need to treat it like a Barolo, though. No, no, no. I think that, but, um, you know, it, it, three hours in a decanter with the Castellari, and I think it's going to start to fade move away from yeah, yeah, not fade, but yeah, move away from what it should be. Right, um, right. Yeah. But all of this would, would would benefit from a bit of air for sure. Yeah, um, right. But I think the evolution in the glass versus the evolution in, in a decanter. Okay. Um, I, I I find the one in the glass a lot more alluring um, yeah. to, right. to my palate and to my intellect. Um, so I, I like to to feel a wine as it as it evolves. <laughs> right. And in a decanter, you know, when, especially when it comes to old Barolo and stuff, um, you know, some of those they just need time to settle down a little bit. They're a little right. Bit up. Um, sorry, excuse me. My dog's doing something strange. Pardon me, Pietro. Take over. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Doing oh, back, back. No, I think I think actually just observing it in the glass is I find it way more rewarding than trying to sort of nudge something to a particular mm -hmm. point. I like actually being able to track what it's doing and feel like it's you know a, a dialogue or you know, a progressive dialectic mm -hmm. going on. Um, mm -hmm. I don't mind if it's a little bit tight at first and challenging and then sort mm -hmm. of does something unexpectedly. I think that's great. Um, I, I generally don't decant that much unless, you know, unless it's something I know is either it's too young, that would be the first time, like something that's actually not really quite ready to drink. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty cautious from there on out with decanting. Mm -hmm. It is, I don't know, it just feels, it's a bit, uh, it's like going to third base really fast. It's just sort of invasive. I agree. I agree. Uh, although the, I will and say you weren't I, talking about baseball, were you? <laughs> <laughs> Back to mute, David. Back to mute. Nature, uh, are you recounting your high school stories here? <laughs> <laughs> I wish. Um, you know, I, I agree with that. But I had an, had an experience with those old Beyond the Santi wines that really turned my oh. head. And uh, I'll tell you, uh, that... The winery had suggested that uh, you give them a six-hour decant. Um, now, I was doing, I think, 11 vintages for a group of, like, 14 people who paid a significant amount of money per ticket for this, this class that I was to class slash dinner event, um, introducing Beyond Santi, and I didn't have the guts to go six hours. Um, I just didn't want to do that, so I went, like, four. And I thought the wines were beautiful, but 1955 on hour eight, as everyone was gone and I had the last bit in my glass, then it started to open. <laughs> Those wow. wines are all Sangiovese, 100%. Um, and so that, that, yeah. Yeah, so the, the, I think the decanting thing, I, it really depends. For me, the Moncali, this wine is, it feels like it was crafted to be drunk fresh. And is mm -hmm. that a kind of an interesting stage in its life? And I'm happy to know it. 
at, at this particular stage. I don't think it's going to mm. improve with it, with age. Um, yeah. But uh, so, so this one I think is meant to be crafted young and fresh. And this one here, I think is, it has some age ability to it. Although I don't think the vintage is quite speaking that to me. Um, it's not t saying I'm all wound up and need to relax in a cellar for two or five years or so. Um, but I don't think it would hurt it. It would integrate it and soft it. But I think a sturdy decanting for this one would be good. Um, but for your prima materia, I mean, would you put that down for a few years or do you make it to be drunk like as is? Well, it's, you know, it's warm climate California, so it's going to come out sort of drinkable no matter what. Yep. Um, the one thing that's bugging me about it, uh, lined up with the other wines, is that the young vines are showing on the lack of finish and lack of length. On your wine? On my wine, yeah. It's it's much more loaded up front, um, but there's no minerality on the back palate, none of that sort of buzzing, sustain, echoing. Um, and I think that's just a function of age of the vines, which I'm envious of these other folks that have older vines. They've been living with for 40, 50, 60 years. Yeah, they hold on a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, California is always gonna be a little more upfront. We can't. It is. It is. I mean, I've had Camus from, you know, 1978 and those wines were really lovely. They weren't what they yeah. were, what they are now, but they stood up. It not doesn't, all, not it all, doesn't all. <laughs> they stood up. So, yeah. Those, yeah. Well, yeah. It's a wide world out there. Yeah, it certainly is. Ageability is always a big question, certainly with the Italian wines, I think. Yeah. Yeah, because they, they, you know, there's a, there's always a stage that Italian wines go through in the glass. Mm. There's like mm. a prom stage for every Italian wine in the glass. They're just, they're just weird at some point, and then they kind of yeah. blow up. They're okay. That's what I like about the Mokali right now. It's from, it's like... Is it doing stuff? The last mm. artistic explosion of a late 40s person before you he or she gives up like it's i don't know no i think it's really really fun it has an interesting yeah. aesthetic well i have a question for paul and pietro so being that i that i will need to drink a bottle per day in again <laughs> you recommend i space it out pietro you want to take that we go for your wine first uh, one of these ones is gonna have to hit day three. Are you gonna go for like a glass from each bottle a day? I could do that and then see how all three changes throughout the long weekend, or I could focus on a bottle a day. Oh, go do a, do a glass from each bottle, because then you learn three wines. Yeah, it's a yeah. track. I have a hunch as to what will go on, but, or with the wines anyway. With the one, <laughs> I was like, "Wait a second. No idea otherwise. But yeah, I get the feeling the Castellari is kind of that. It's an okay vintage. It's you know, it's not pushing it any holes yeah. too far. Um, I think mine will actually hold up fairly well and continue being spicy and bright for you know a day or two. Yeah. See, that's interesting. I, I, I think your wine will, but I think the Castellari tomorrow is going to be really lovely. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually going to... I've had good experiences with Castellari before. Yeah, they're beautiful wines. Yeah. yeah. And this, you know, 2018, it was not, um, it was not like 17. 17 was a vintage that uh, showed a lot of pedigree, although there was a lot less fruit on the vine in 17. Um, 18 is a little bit of a more of a broader vintage. They got a little bit more of a harvest, a little more ton per hectare. And yeah, yeah. I think in the hands of people who know what they're doing. Um, yeah, I'd be hard pressed to not, not want to try their yeah. wines in any vintage. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. yeah. cool. All right. I think we've done it. We are less than a minute away from the two hour mark. And uh, shall we call it? Any other questions or thoughts? Thank you. This is, uh, this, Thank you. This is great. That's fine. Thank you. Great. Nice, to, nice to see everyone. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you all. You'll hear from us soon. Thank you. I'm sorry, David. What were you saying? 
just that I've drank Sangiovese for years and I feel like um, I feel so much more aware of the range of what the grape does. So it's really, this is really, really, really cool. Cool. Now, this is something that will inform my drinking for the rest of my life. God willing, I'll be a lot of drinking for the rest of my life. So thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there are all the monkey sub zones to go after. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's up now? Thank you, Paul. My pleasure. Are there going to be any more of these? Yeah, we're going to do, uh, um, what is it, uh, Sagrantino or Negro Amado? I think we should do Negro Amado. We, we should definitely do Sagrantino, but maybe we should do Negro Amaro. <laughs> first. Yeah, that's what I mean. No, exactly. Negro Amaro and then Sagrantino. Yeah, I, I definitely think that, you know, I have this new group of friends that I don't really know, but I really enjoy spending time with. So I think we should just keep adding more and more wines. <laughs> Good. I, you're talking about us and not your friends in the room, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I should, uh, like, that's really awkward. They're right there. They can hear you. <laughs> he knows us too well. <laughs> Oh, what's that? Ooh, that's cool. <laughs> wow, Kevin, you got some, you're, you're going slow now, man. That's cool. <laughs> Kevin's like a freak. Good. All right, thank you, guys. Buena, buena note. Thank buena you. Note. Buena 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 note. Buena note. Happy holidays. Bye, right, guys. Thanks for coming. Bye. Thank Ciao. you. Bye. Right, yeah, have a good weekend. Bye. Bye. Take care.